because they prepare. See, your Bible school and all these wonderful meetings you have with Bishop, what are you doing? You're preparing. And so that's key for you to be at this conference, preparing, putting aside, learning what's coming so that you're prepared and you have the food, the spiritual food you need. But then the second little thing, and you're not going to understand this so well as I will because I'm from Colorado, is a rock rabbit. Now, you don't have those in Detroit, but I live in Colorado. Rock rabbits live in the mountains, and they are little tiny rabbits, and they can slip through the crevice of the rock when a coyote comes after them or a dog comes after them because they're little. And they get through that little crevice in the rock, and they build their house in the rock. What are we doing here? You're building your house in the rock of ages. Amen. So look at someone and say, honey, I know something about you. You're building your house while you're here. Amen. But the third thing, locusts. What about locusts? Why are they so wise? Because they stay in unity with each other. And that's key. So stand up. The exercise is good for you, so don't get nervous. Join hands. Join hands. Say, it is powerful and very important that I stay in unity. There is power, power in unity. Amen. You can be seated. We stay in unity. Why? Because we're wise. But the fourth thing, ah, the fourth is my favorite. But I don't think I have time to give you the fourth. So you can watch our television program and see the fourth. Is that okay? You want to know this morning? Well, if enough people raise both hands, I'll tell you this morning. My favorite. I love this. This is the spider. Now, you can clean your house, and everything is nice. You're having people for dinner, and all at once, a spider will drop down. You think, where did that spider come from? Because spiders are opportunists. Amen? And so, what about opportunists? They say a spider can put out that little string, and you can find a spider from this island on an island 200 miles away, because the wind blows them there. They're opportunists. What are we? We're opportunists. We're looking for opportunities to pray for the sick. We're looking for opportunities to win people to Christ. We're looking for opportunities to get people spirit-filled. We love people, and people love us. So put your hand on your heart. Say, I love people. My church loves people. And people love us. Amen. Opportunists. So I'm just going to tell you one little thing. I was in China, and I've really been to China the most, 34 times. And so I had a big team of people with me. And uh, the guide, beautiful Chinese woman, she could speak English well. The guide we had, I said, uh, I would like to take you to breakfast. She said, I don't want to go to breakfast with you. Just real. I said, well, how about lunch? I don't want to have a meal with you. And I said, well, I'm speaking tonight. I'm speaking in a church. She said, I'm a communist. I don't go to church, and I don't want to be with you. But you know, we don't know how to give up, do we? The game is not over till I win. Is that right? And so the next day, she comes to pick up our people to take them sightseeing. We had had the service that night, and she said to me, I couldn't believe it. I saw, and I had a different DVD of Pakistan, I couldn't believe all those Muslims there and what was going on. I said, you were in church last night. Yes. I said, well, go to breakfast with me today. I'm not going to breakfast with you. <laughs> well, I said, how about lunch? I'm not going to lunch with you. And I said, well, tonight is my last night. Come to church. I am a communist. And I'm not going to church. But see, we don't know how to give up. Put your hand on your heart. 
Say, I'm a spider. I'm a spider. I don't know how to give up. So that night, you know, I preached. I didn't see her. We, we had maybe 3,000 people there. So I'm walking out to get into the van, and here comes Chong. And so I thought, wow, I wonder where she came from. So I jumped out of the van, and this is what Jesus said to me. He said, get her and get her now. I said, Chong, do you have Jesus in your heart? She said, no. I said, would you like to? She said, yes. And she got born again. And she's a leader in that church now. And that's about five years ago. Oh, people, we go for the lost. Amen. I feel dead for you to stand up again. <laughs> stand up. Turn around. Look at me. Say, this conference, this conference is bringing a turnaround in me. Amen. 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 You can be seated. So God spoke to you prophetically. You are an ant. You're a rock rabbit. You're locust. You stay in unity. And what else? You're a spider. You just love sinners and sinners are attracted to you. Amen. Ecclesiastes. Now let me say this to you, just to kind of give you the layout of the Bible, because I know you're so hooked on the book and on the Word of God. But if you look at Old Testament, you have the Pentateuch. That's the first part. Then you have the history books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. And then you have what is called the wisdom books. And these are the ones we really like the most probably. It's Job and Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. And then you have the prophets. And so many times Christians are prophetless because they don't read the prophets. But the prophets really reveal Jesus. So this morning we're in the wisdom book. So we're in Ecclesiastes wisdom. Now, let me just share. I didn't used to like this book. You know, I'd read through the Bible several times a year, but I'd always read through Leviticus real fast and Ecclesiastes real fast. But then my daughter said to me, oh, one of my favorite books is Ecclesiastes. And I thought, maybe there's something wrong with me. <laughs> this is a wisdom book. And God began to open this book to my heart. And that's my passion for you this morning, that God opens the, his wisdom to you this morning. Now, to me, it was a real groany book, you know, because all he did is whine, life under the sun, oh, it's so hard, on and on and on, you know, it's just the same old thing, just a circle of events, same events. And then the Lord began to deal with me and said, that is life under the S-U-N. But you don't live under the S-U-N. You live under the S-O-N. So what God is going to give you this morning is life under the S-O-N. So I want you to turn to Ecclesiastes 3. And I want to minister to you, and the Holy Spirit wants to minister to you, about the seasons in your life. So if you look at this, it says, To everything there is a season. A time for every purpose under heaven. So God has seasons in our lives, and he has purposes in the season. So put your hand on your heart again. Said there's a purpose for every season in my life. So God has purposes. And then he begins to tell you, you know, there's a time to be born, a time to die. And if you look at all of them, well, I think we'll just look. Look at verse 3. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. So if we count these up, there are 28 seasons in your life. Now, there's something else I want you to see 
in verse 11. So look at verse 11. I'm going to count to three, and we're going to read it out loud together because I want the Holy Spirit to really rock your boat this morning. So I'll count to three and then read out loud with me. You say, I didn't bring a Bible. Well, smile at someone who did or get your phone out. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Now, he says he makes everything beautiful in his time. So God wants to make every season of your life beautiful. Are you hearing me? So in each season, we need to look at the beauty of what God has in that season for us. We don't want to whine like Solomon did. That's life under the S-U-N. We want to rejoice because we have life under the S-O-N. So these seasons are very important and every season in your life has a purpose. And that's key for you too. So put your hand on your heart again. Say, I cannot forget. Every season has a purpose. And then eternity is in all of this. We know this life is temporary. And we have eternal life because we have Jesus. But what in this season does he want to make beautiful? And I was thinking of the seasons in my life. You know, you think of the times you were growing up and all of those things. But I think how he had his hand on me. I can remember when I was six years old and lying on the ground. I was born in Texas looking up at the sky and seeing an airplane and saying, someday I'll be in an airplane. Well, now I've been in 134 countries, so I've been in a lot of airplanes. But did I ever dream at six years old God would have that? But he was beginning. Amen? Everybody say beginning. Then, you know, we moved to Pennsylvania during the war. Uh, my father helped build the ships. And I remember going to school in seventh grade, and I took Latin, you know, because East Coast, that was kind of required. And then I took French, and I thought, oh, I really like these languages. And I did very well in them. That was the season. And in that season, I also got born again. And so I thought, someday, I'm going to be a foreign ambassador. And I'm going, you know, I'm going to learn languages. And I'm going to really go overseas. And maybe I'll go to France and be a foreign ambassador. Or I'll go to Italy. Or I'll go someplace. But my goal inside was to be a foreign ambassador. I loved foreign languages. Well, then I went to university, graduated with a collective major in foreign languages, Spanish, French, and Latin, began to teach school. And see, what I love about seasons, God has a process in them for you. Everybody say purpose in the season that I'm in. And he makes it beautiful. Okay, so then I get out of school, I'm teaching, you know, I get out of university, I'm teaching school, and I'm teaching languages, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to get my master's, and I'm going to be a foreign ambassador, and my mother goes to some crazy Pentecostal church. We're Methodist, what's she doing over there? And she gets born again and spirit-filled. And my father was in a mental hospital, they said he'd never come out, and my mother believes in healing and miracles because she's been watching all Roberts. Oh, dear. <laughs> and so she went to the hospital, pinned a prayer cloth on my father. They said he'd never come out. He came out within a year, got born again in spirit filled. What am I in? I'm in a season. I'm in a process. And it's under the S-O-N. And he makes it beautiful. So my mother wanted me to go to this Pentecostal church. I did not like it. 
They raised their hands. They spoke in tongues. They danced. Oh. They clapped even. But my mother introduced me to a man who had just gotten spirit-filled. He was very handsome, very nice. So he invited me to church. So I went to church, not for spiritual reasons, but because I liked this man. And we began to date, and we got engaged. And one night, he was coming to our house for dinner. My mother's an excellent cook. And he called and said, I'll come later, but I'm not coming for dinner. So I said, later, why didn't you come for dinner? He said, I'm fasting. I said, fasting? What are you fasting for? He said, you. I was terribly insulted. Terribly insulted. I said, you don't need to fast for me. I'm saved. He said, yeah, but you're not committed. And he said, I serve the devil with all my heart. Now I'm going to serve God with all my heart. And I'm not going to marry a half-committed woman. Oh, I was so angry with him. I said, do you want your ring back? And I was hopeful he'd say no. He said, well, I don't know. He said, I'm on a fast for three days. Oh, my goodness. And I'm teaching school. I can't sleep at night. The first night... The Lord really dealt with me and talked to me and said, I want to surrender from you. From you. I want you to be spirit-filled. You've known about it for four years, but you never make a decision to surrender. So I said, no, I don't, you know, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a Pentecostal. They're crazy. No way. So the second night, I couldn't sleep again. God's dealing with me again about the same thing. I said, no. I do not want to be spirit-filled. I want to marry Wallace Hickey, but I don't want to speak in tongues. And the third night, thank God he doesn't give up on us. Isn't he wonderful? Oh, he's so wonderful. So the third night, he said, you know, if you turn me down now, he said, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. He said, you're going to move to California. You will not marry Wallace Hickey. He said, you will marry a Christian, you'll get your master's, you'll teach school, you'll have a good life, you'll die and go to heaven. He said, but if you surrender to me now, I have something so wonderful you cannot imagine. Now, did I ever dream I would go to 134 nations? Did I ever dream that I would really be a foreign ambassador? Did I ever dream that I would go to Pakistan when we go in November, we will have a million people in our meeting in Karachi. Did I ever dream that? See, God is so much better than anything you can imagine. But he says he makes everything beautiful in what? His time. And so you need to look for the beauty of the Lord in the time you are in. Now, let me tell you, after I married Wallace Hickey, I got spirit filled. I was teaching school, and the third year we were married, he felt called into the ministry. Now, I didn't. I don't want to go in the ministry. No way. But I'm married to him, so I'm stuck. So what do you do? And so we went into the ministry, and we started, in a couple years later, a church in Denver. So now I am a pastor's wife. Oh, yuck. You know, ugh. But I began to enjoy it. You know, well, I'm not a foreign ambassador, you know, and at that time I wasn't teaching school, but I really had a passion to reach people who didn't know the Bible. Because the first year I was married, I heard Kenneth Hagin. And I thought, you know, if the word will work like that for him, it'll work that way for me. So everybody say, God is cooking. God is cooking. And notice it's a process. Look at someone and say, honey, it's a, process. it's a process. Don't give up in your season until you win. Amen! We don't know how to give up, but we know how to win. So let me show you the beautiful things God did in that. Of all the things I've ever gotten to do, I think pastoring is the best. Amen. 
You say, well, that's so hard. Folks, pastoring is the best because that's where the rubber meets the road. Right? I mean, you can evangelize. You come in, you look good, you smell good, you preach good, you leave. But when you pastor, you don't feed them the same thing every time. You've got to be fresh. They don't want to hear a month ago sermon this Sunday. So you have to constantly study and prepare. Amen? And so always you're preparing. And then another thing about pastoring. You pour your guts into some people and they walk out on you and act like, how do I spell your name? You feel like you'd like to slap them sideways. Where are you anyway? This is pastoring. And so I had the wonderful experience of being a pastor's wife. But let me tell you, I got to be a spider while I was a pastor's wife. And so I thought, how do you get people in the Bible? I was so eager to get Lutherans and Catholics and Baptists and Presbyterians, you know, in the Bible because I had not had the Bible and I'd heard faith teaching. So I said to the Lord, it doesn't seem like we get very many people saved in our church. Where are the sinners? He said, if you want sinners, you'll have to go to where they are. So I met a couple, and uh, they were not saved. And they said to me, have you ever thought of having a Bible study? They were Methodists. And I said, well, where? They said, our house. God is cooking. God is cooking. And so I had a Bible study. We had seven the first time. It began to grow. And then the women said, we need a night Bible study. So our husbands want to get saved too. And pretty soon I had 22 home Bible studies. This was a very powerful season in my life. It wasn't that I knew the Bible so well, because they would ask me questions, and I'd say, next week I'll have the answer. So I had to learn the Bible on a real one-to-one -one basis where the rubber meets the road. Then, now watch the process. Everybody say the season. So the Bible study said to me, why don't you go on the radio, you know, and the week you could invite people to these Bible studies. And I didn't have the money, I, and I called. They said, well, five minutes a day, weekday, it'll cost you $60. So I went to my husband. And I told him, I said, wouldn't the church like to pay for this? And he said, we don't feel led. <laughs> Thanks, I'm your wife. <laughs> he said, but the Bible studies will do it. So they did. And then it began to increase. And I remember being on radio here in Detroit. And I'm going to tell you right now, Detroit is my favorite city to come to. This is where I really got cooking, was back here. I would come and have big crowds. Oh, that was awesome to me. Everybody say Detroit. Detroit. I believe Detroit has God's special hand on it. I really do. So then they increased. I'm on 488 radio stations. It's syndicated. And I feel led to go on television. This is 45 years ago. So I went to Channel 9, Secular Channel, had to meet with a group of men, their board, and I just wanted 30 minutes on Sunday morning. And so they looked at me and they said, uh, you are not television material. You would never make it. You need to stay with radio. You don't even look like television. But here's the wonderful thing about Jesus. He thinks you can do anything. Put your hand on your heart again. Say, Jesus, Jesus. thinks I can do anything. So I went on television 30 minutes on Sunday mornings. And it was expensive, you know. And so we got behind with our bill. And so I went to my husband and said, uh, wouldn't the church like to give me $5,000 and help me with my bill? He said, we'll pray about it. I thought, don't pray, just say yes. <laughs> and so he prayed. He said, no, we don't feel led. I thought, this is the strangest thing. You never feel led for me. And I'm your wife and you love missions. Yuck. And within two days, I was holding a Bible study in an Anglican church. 
and some people took me out to lunch and the woman said to me, how much does it cost to be on the radio for a year? So I said, well, multiply it out because she heard the radio. And she said to, and I, I multiplied it out. She told me to. She said to her husband, honey, write Marilyn a check for $6,000. I said, honey, do it. <laughs> he makes everything beautiful in his time. Don't jump out of the boat. Stay in and look for what the S-O-N can do in your life in this time. Now, interesting, you know those 45, are those that board, they're not in television, I am, 45 years later. This is what we live in, people. We live in the supernatural in every season in your life. It ain't over till you win. Because it says, thanks be unto God who always leads us to triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge every place. You know, I smell winning perfume in here. Would you stand up? You smell so good. Woo! Now I want you to say that scripture with me. Say, thanks be unto God who always leads me to triumph in Christ. And through me diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge. Every place I go, I smell like a winner. Amen, amen, amen. That's what it says. You can be seated. Seasons. Maybe you're in the season of teenagers. Oh. Anything, skip that one. But you know what? It's not over till you win. I have to tell you another story about Detroit, how important Detroit is to me. Sarah, you know, she was easy to raise, really. She went to ORU, went overseas, came back confused, and she said, I don't know if I believe in Jesus anymore. This is the way I was raised, so I never had a choice. So maybe Buddha's right, you know, or maybe the Hindus or Muhammad is right. And so I heard myself say this because God will make you supernatural as a parent. And we need this. Amen? I said, well, Sarah, your faith is being tested, but you'll come out of this better than when you went in. Jesus will be more real to you. And she looked at me like, yeah, I bet. So she went back to ORU. She's a senior. And the end of November, she called me and she said, Mom, she said, I've recommitted my life to Jesus. Oh, brother, was that good news? And she said, the young man who helped me, he spent a year in France, you know, and he said his faith was very tested, but he studied the Gospel of John. So he and I have been going through the Gospel of John every week and I've recommitted my life. And she said, this young man, his father was saved in your meeting in Detroit 15 years ago. God is so economical. He uses everything. Just keep looking for him to make it beautiful. And stay in the process. That is so important because there's a purpose. There's an important purpose in that season. I want to tell you another one. And I'm going some more in this. I want God to just dig in your heart. I want when you go home to your church, you think you're the best thing since sliced bread. My goodness, I'm big, I'm great, I'm powerful, I have favor, I'm successful, I'm a person of the word, the, better, the devil better watch out, I'm on my feet and cooking. Amen. So I like to take teams of people overseas. And so I've been doing this for a long time. So probably I've taken 56, 57 teams. So we went to Tibet. And this would be about a year and a half ago. Now you're not allowed to do anything in Tibet. China owns Tibet. China has been very cruel to the Tibetans, the Buddhists. I mean, they've killed them. The Dalai Lama's not allowed to live there. They have another Lama in place. But they're just cruel very cruel. And so they told us going in, don't take any tracks in your suitcase. Don't talk to anybody. 
you know, or we'll get you out of here. We won't put up with anything. So everything was really strict. I have 104 people with me and I always take people to minister, but we're told we can't do anything. I said, oh, we can do everything. We can do prayer walking. Look at your feet. Look at your feet. Say, I can claim territory for God with my feet. Amen. So I said, we're going to prayer walk. So we did prayer walking, and it's so high over there, it's hard to breathe. And you have to have, get extra oxygen. So, you know, we're walking in Jesus' name. We're claiming it. And of course, you see all these prayer wheels and all these different things. And my guide, very brilliant uh, Tibetan, educated in China, said to me, do you know anything about Jesus? Is the Pope a Catholic? I guess I do. I said, uh, well, yes, I do. And <coughs> we had smuggled in four Bibles in their language. So I said, well, I have a Bible. I have four Bibles in your language. Well, he said, I want the first one. And then he went to the head lama and told him that I had three Bibles in their language. And we have this one picture. And the head lama invited me to come and give him the three Bibles in his language. And he started a Bible study with every monk in Tibet. And one of the women in our church has told me this recently. They said there had been 230,000 monks in Tibet who are born again. See, the season, be faithful in the season, because in his time, he's going to make it beautiful. So stand up. Oh, here we go again. Now, folks, we need to claim things with our feet. And if that can work in Tibet, we're going to do it soon in Greece and Israel. We're going to do prayer walking big time. So I want you to look at your feet. Say, Jesus said, Jesus. he gives me power gives me to power. tread on scorpions over all the power of the enemy. I can tread on serpents and nothing will harm me. In Jesus' name, I am walking, claiming my neighborhood, claiming my city. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. You can be seated. Now, I just love sinners. And sinners love me. So, you know, I go to restaurants that are near my house. When I walk in, I claim the waiters. I claim the owners. I don't shout it out loud. You know, but I'm friendly. I give big tips. And so I was with one of our friends the other, not too long ago, maybe two years ago, and we prayed over our food. And this waiter came and said, oh, my mother lives in Hawaii and there's a big storm coming. And I saw that you prayed. Would you pray for my mother? Oh, yeah, we'd be happy to. So then I got his name. His name is Nathan. I said, every time I go in, I said, Nathan, do you have some prayer requests for me? Write them down. I'll take him and pray over him. So when I come in, he said, I'll go get a pen and paper, Marilyn. I'll be right back. And so recently I said, you know, Nathan, you need to be sure you have Jesus in your heart. And I got to pray with him the sinner's prayer. That, that's the happiest thing I can do. That makes me slap happy. And I said, what about your girlfriend? He said, she's at the bar. I said, let's get her too. <laughs> Folks, we've got to win the loss. That's God's number one thing. When I get on a plane, you got them at least for two hours. You know, let's have a passion to win the lost of our cities. You know, that's, and honestly, getting to lead someone to Christ, it's one of the, it's one of the most joyful things. It's almost like getting saved all over. So I'll tell you another thing. In our property, we bought a shopping center. They have an AA center. You know what AA is. And so they let, some of the meetings are open, so I got to go. 
and they go around, it's a very nice meeting. They go around, they say, I'm Joe, I'm an alcoholic, I'm Marianne, I'm an alcoholic, I'm Marilyn, I love alcoholics. <laughs> and they look around, and my name is on the door, so they, oh, are you that Marilyn? Now, the head of it, the only paid person there, Jean Campbell, she's come to church and gotten born again. And so every now and then, you know, I get to talk to somebody, maybe outside. I don't make a big deal out of it. But the other day, <clears throat> between our Sunday services and my son-in-law had preached a, ser a sermon on soul winning, I just thought, where's the sinner? And so I thought, go to AA. They meet on Sundays. So I went down. This is between services. And there's a man named Tim there. And he has told me very honestly, I don't believe in God. Don't talk to me. I like you, but don't talk to me. And so I went in. I was so anointed from that sermon. That anointing was on me. I said, Tim, you need to be born again. He said, I do. I said, let's pray now. He said, okay. <laughs> don't guess who can't be saved. He got you, right? Amen. So look for opportunities. We are spiders. So in this process of time, what is God doing? Ask him to make it beautiful. Ask him to make it beautiful with your children. Ask him to give you favor in the community. And don't, I mean, look for people that you can be friendly to and love. Almost everybody will respond to love. And also everybody responds to a healing prayer. People, when they're sick, you know, sometimes when they check out groceries, I'll say, how are you? Oh, I have a horrible headache. Would you mind if I just took a minute and prayed with you? Folks, Vietnamese nail salons are wonderful. I mean, I love to go to Vietnamese nail salons. They get saved. Awesome God. So look at verse 11. He makes everything beautiful in his time. Is your season not very beautiful? Well, then it's not over yet. Because, honey, it ain't over till it gets beautiful. Is your marriage not where you want it to be? It ain't over yet. He's going to make it beautiful. And remember, all these things we are doing, that's just a taste. We get to have eternity. And everybody has eternity in their heart. They know there's a future, but you know yours. Say, I know my destiny. <laughs> I'm going to heaven. Now, another thing I want to give you is uh, I want to talk to you about this wisdom book. Have you ever met anybody who said, I'd love to be stupid? I have never. Everybody would like to be wise, right? And that's so key for us. So I want to give you something for your vision, the wonderful vision you have here under Bishop Butler. See, I love to come here because his vision is so powerful. You know, I think, good night, he's in Bulgaria oh, and Poland and Birmingham. Where is he going next? Are you going to Africa? Where are you? Athens. That's vision. I'm going to Athens in two weeks. And we're doing prayer walking with 120 people. So we'll claim it for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's just think about wisdom for ourselves. Wisdom. If you look at the Greek word, it's very interesting. It is Sophia. You can spell it S-O-P-H-I-A. It's a girl's name. Well, what does it mean? It means the wisdom of ultimate things. God has a big picture for everyone. Nobody is an accident. Everybody is a divine appointment. If you don't believe it, read Psalm 139. Memorize it. It is so wonderful. So, before I was born, God had a plan. Before you were born. The talents he gave you, the place you live. God had a plan. And he knows it line by line and keeps track of it in a book. 
So Sophia is the big plan. Everybody say big plan. Big plan. But there's another word for wisdom. And this will really help you as pastors and leaders. It is the word phronesis. P-H-R-O-N-E-S-I-S. Phronesis. Now, what is phronesis? It's the how-to. So, you know, you can say, oh, here's this big plan. And those of you pastoring, you know, you always have people in your church, they're going to go, they're Reinhard Bonnke. They're going to go have biggest meetings Africa's ever had, and they won't even go across the street and witness to a neighbor. Amen? So what is the phronesis? It's really Proverbs. It's how to. Everybody say how to. And so I have found out God will give you a how to. Now, international ministry for me, I know the how to in Buddhist countries. I know the how to in Muslim countries. I know the how to in Hindu countries. I know the how to in communist countries, atheistic countries. The how to is healing. Everybody say healing. And the Bible says healing is the bread of the children. And, you know, sometimes when I go to Pakistan and I get up to preach, I feel about as spiritual as a mouse. I'm tired. I have jet lag. And I'm supposed to be spiritual and pray for all these Muslims that are sick as dogs. And I said that to the Lord. Oh, Lord, I have jet lag. I'm tired. And this is what he said. It's not your name. It's mine. It's not how you feel, honey. It's who he is. Now put your hand on your heart. Say, I will not forget. It's not how I feel. It's who he is. Amen. And so phronesis is the how-to. Maybe it's taking somebody for coffee. Maybe it's fixing fried chicken for them. I mean, there are a lot of how-tos. Muslims in our city, they like to go to coffee with you. They like gifts from you. They like to have you come to their house for meals. So that's the phronesis. Everybody say phronesis. And getting the how-to, you know, and, and there's a how-to with people. There's a how-to with your mean relatives. You know, get the how-to. Maybe it's gifts. I don't know what. But that phronesis has been very key for me. Those home Bible studies, I had no idea I would end up reaching over 2 billion people every weekday. And now we have Facebook and it's free. <laughs> Whee! All right, and you have Facebook to use. Mm. And I'm looking at all kinds of creative ways to use Facebook. Now, that phronesis, your Facebook is a how-to. Learn the how-to. Ask God, show me how to reach this person. Show me how to reach my family. Show me how to reach this neighborhood. Get the phronesis. That is key. This is very important. Everybody say phronesis. phronesis. But then the third word, three words for wisdom, is sunesis. I'll spell it. S-U-N-E-S-I-S. -S -S. Oh, why is this so important? This is networking. How God puts you in with people and then gives you favor, gives you wisdom with that person and networks you to open a door. Are you hearing me? I had a great desire to go to Sudan. Well, trying to get into Khartoum, Sudan, you know, is not a picnic. But if God tells you to go, he thinks you can do it. So throw it back in his lap. You think I can do it? Then you help me here. So I'm at Billy Joe Doherty's. This is years ago. And I said, you know, I have such a desire to go to Sudan. But, you know, I can't get in. And a man was there and he said, I know their number one delegate. I meet him in Bel Belgium. He's a backslidden Christian. I'll give you his name. And we got in. Everybody say networking. networking. And tomorrow night I'm going to show you a video of Khartoum, Sudan, where we had 65,000 people. Look at someone and say, honey, 
God's cooking good things for you. Amen. Networking. And probably one of the biggest ones, and I've told this here before, was in 1983, uh, I saw in the newspaper and in television, Ethiopia, it was in famine, it was under communism, is very dark time. And the Lord said to me, I want you to take food and Bibles, because the communists were killing the Christians, and they're orthodox Christians. And, you know, food and Bibles? He said, yes. And so I was to take 10,000 Bibles, $10,000 worth of food. Now these Bibles are in the Amharic. So, you know, we're trying to get the Minister of Affairs in D.C. to give an okay. Couldn't get him, couldn't get him. I've already bought the food, already bought the Bibles. Two days before I'm to leave. And I love this about God. He doesn't wear a watch. <laughs> and he's very last minute. And I have all this food. Well, food you could give away, but Amharic Bibles, only Ethiopians speak Amharic. And so my staff said to me, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go. You don't have a visa. I said, I know, but I'm going to go. I'll get a visa. And an Ethiopian woman had gotten saved in our church. So I called her. She came down and she said, who are you calling in D.C.? Well, I couldn't say the name right. So she called him and she laughs and she talks to him in Amharic and she laughs, she hangs up the phone. She said, you'll have your visa tomorrow. I said, how did you get it? She said, he's my old boyfriend. <laughs> That's Sunesis. Everybody say Sunesis. God is so sneaky. And he has so many ways that he can move in your life. Amen? And what does he want to say to you this morning? He makes everything beautiful in his time. So we have all these seasons. Now I'm going to tell you one more. Are you cool? Yes. You can make it. Yes. You're not hungry. No. You can eat a big lunch. You'll be cool. <laughs> I was married uh, 57 years to Wallace Hickey. Boy, he really got a good wife. So, before he died, uh, he had some problems and we had to put him in a home to help him. He became very feeble. And one day I was in my office and I'm a nap person. It seems like I need a lot of sleep. So, you know, I'll take a nap every day and if I'm going to stay at the office, I'll take it in my office and I'll sleep maybe an hour and then get up and work. So I awakened, I was taking a nap, and I awakened, and I thought, I've never felt anything like this. It was the presence of God in the most unusual way. And it was almost frightening to me. And then I saw light coming through the crack of the door, and then the light filled the door. And the Lord said to me, I took you through your father's death miraculously and your mothers, and that was true, and your brothers, and I'm going to take you through Wallace's death miraculously. You will never grieve. So he didn't die right away. He died two years later, and the night he died, the glory of God fell on me, and when I got up the next morning, I'm singing in tongues. I said, what is this? He said, I danced over you. So people said, oh, I know you went through terrible grief. No, I didn't. He made it beautiful. Amen. Amen. Now stand up. You know, I feel like God is cooking a lot of vision here. Woo! You know, I feel sorry for the devil where you live. There's a lot of vision here. And see, honestly, looking at the vision of your bishop and Deborah and their faithfulness through the years, folks, 
you need people that have mileage. You know, I'm getting called and I'm going more than I've ever gone. Well, you're 85. Give me a break. Aren't you going to retire? I am retired. <laughs> Retiring is doing what you like. Hey! And so you are very blessed to be a part of this vision. So just join hands. I want to pray God's special blessings on you and on your work and on the place where you are called and on just hanging in, honey. Don't give up. Remember, the game isn't over till you win. And you're wearing, wearing winning perfume. So pray with me. Say, Father, I know you have great miracles for me. You're making things beautiful in my life. You're doing things I could never dream of. I have favor in places I would never dream of having favor. I love sinners. Sinners love me. I love the place where I live. Even my mean relatives love me. I am being mightily used in this season, in Jesus' name. Amen! You can be seated. One, I'm going to ask. Now, if you just give me a few more minutes, I want to just show you some resource material. Now, I know you study all the time. I do, too. And, you know, on planes, nobody can talk to me, so I always study. So I want to give you some things, but... One thing, this is the thing I want to give you, is the Speak the Word booklet. Now, folks, I have this probably in I don't know how many languages. I go all over the world. And so these are promises that you can speak, and I know, you know, Bishop has that, but I'm good too. So you can get that. That's free. All you do is sign a card. Now, what I minister today from Ecclesiastes came to me in a very difficult sick time of my life. And this is the book that goes with it. Enjoy life. And so my life is so beautiful, so is yours. But do you know how to enjoy life? My favorite thing of all, hold that up for me, it's so big, is seeing Jesus. Now, I love to get people hooked on the whole book. So a lot of Christians, they don't read Old Testament. Mm -mm -mm. You think you don't, but when you read New Testament, you're reading a lot of it, right? But Jesus is in every book. Now, we have this in six different languages. This is taught all over the world. And so, if you could buy one thing, I would say, get this if you don't have it. Because it'll show you who he is in every book, even has a picture. And I wouldn't get one. You give people candy, you make them fat. You give them flowers, they will. Give them God's word and change their lives. Amen. And then I have signs in the heavens. This I'll be teaching on tomorrow morning, but this is a book you will, it'll rattle your cage. It really will. It's taken from Job, a wisdom book, and the zodiac is never meant to tell your fortune. It, all constellations tell the story of Jesus. Even the name of the stars. Oh, I love teaching this. But you can get the book, get two or three, pass them on to people who are kind of crazy. Do you know any crazy people? I just love crazy people. I, I didn't have much popularity in my neighborhood. I live in a cul-de-sac. And they would have drinking parties. So I would go early because they all get drunk. And then I didn't drink. So, you know, they just said, oh, you know, holier than thou. But I claim favor, right? I love sinners. Sinners are wild over me. Nothing happened. The next door neighbor, who has been the most bad about talking about me, was in a wheelchair. This is about a month ago, out in the cul-de-sac. I said, oh, Joe! You know, what happened to you? And he said, well, I had two surgeries on my hips. I can't walk. 
I said, Joe, I want to pray for you. I want you to pray for me. He's walking. He doesn't use the wheelchair. I have favor. You just never know how God is going to cook it. Now, these are two kind of big things. Let's hold the penguin up first. You know, Sarah got this because this is a way we can pass on anointing. You know, um, they took claws from the body of Paul, put it on the sick and demon-possessed, right? And then we see the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment. You know, it's another way of passing on an anointing. So we pass these on for children. So these have scriptures on them. We have them in pink and blue. And we've prayed over this, that the child whose body touches this will fulfill the destiny God has for them. And that's so key. So that's like a $50 seed. That helps us with our big meetings. And then this is the biggest prayer cloth you've ever seen. So I'm going to show you how to use it. Okay. Now this has the names of Jesus on it. Look at that. And yeah, thank you, Juana. <laughs> on here, we've prayed over this, that there would be an anointing in this to heal the sick.